It's the Reading Bug. Today's episode of Reading Bug Adventures is sponsored by Penguin Young Readers and their haunting new picture book, There's a Ghost in This House by Oliver Jeffers. Please help support our sponsor by purchasing There's a Ghost in This House at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Hi, reader. Welcome back for an all-new Reading Bug Adventures episode, written, performed, and produced by all of us at The Reading Bug, our family-owned independent bookstore in San Carlos, California. With the holidays just around the corner, please consider continuing to support us by shopping with us. At The Reading Bug, our mission is to educate, entertain, and engage children across the globe, and you can help us by purchasing a book subscription for every young reader you know at readingbugbox.com. Or you can shop at our store at thereadingbug.com where we have millions of books available for purchase for children and grown-ups. You can find our latest recommendations or purchase books from your favorite podcast episodes. Get your orders in soon. Shipping and supply chains are strained this year, but our team is working hard to get all your orders out on time. And if you want The Reading Bug to be part of your school or group fundraising activities, we now have an option for that too. The pandemic has brought a lot of challenges to our bookstore, but it has introduced some exciting new opportunities too. Over the past year, we've been working with schools and community groups to present virtual book fairs. Just pick a week, and we'll send your school an easy ordering link to a branded webpage, along with recommended books for every age. You can also add wish lists and suggestions of your own, and there's no staffing requirements on your side. It's an easy way to raise funds while also supporting our independent bookstore. A portion of the proceeds, based on sales, are donated right back to your school or group. For more information, please have your school administrator contact us at talkback at readingbugadventures.com. Now, before we get started on our adventure, let me thank a few special friends. A great big hello and thank you to our newest patrons. You're part of what makes Reading Bug Adventures podcast possible. To become a patron and support our work, please visit patreon.com slash readingbugadventures. Thanks also to Resonate Recordings, who does the sound mixing and mastery for our podcast, and to all of our sponsors. Okay, reader, are you ready for another adventure with me in the reading bug? Great! Then let's fly. It's time for a reading bug adventure. It's a reading bug adventure. There's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper and your imaginations too. The reading bug and I can't wait to share our trip with you. Well, hello, reader. Thanks so much for joining me on another adventure today. Yeah, thanks for joining us on today's revolutionary adventure, reader. And look who I've brought along to adventure with us. Spelling Bee! Hi, hi, hi! I'm so looking forward to joining you in another beautiful adventure. Uh, uh, uh. Whoa! Reader, Bee, Bug, did you see that? That girl just stomped by us and she kicked over a potted plant. She looks really upset. Whoa, hey, it's okay to be angry or frustrated, but please don't take it out on the plants. My name is Lauren, and this is my reader friend. Is there anything we can do to help? Just leave me alone. I'm having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Just like the book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. You can't do anything to help me. Just buzz off. Buzz off. (laughs) Good one. Huh? Who said that? Would you like to tell us what happened? Sometimes, when I'm upset, it helps for me to talk about it with a friend. I'm running for class president at school. Oh, wow! Good for you! It's wonderful to get involved at school like that. That's what I thought, too. But I'm running against three boys, and one of them told me that girls never get elected president, so I might as well drop out. I was angry, but then I looked it up, and he was right. The United States has had 45 different presidents, but they've all been men. Maybe that boy is right, and it's foolish for me to be running for class president. I really don't want to lose. It would be so embarrassing. Oh, wow. I can understand why that would make you angry and scared. But can I share something with you? I guess. I feel angry and scared sometimes, too. But I have to remind myself that I'm a girl. I'm fantastic. I'm strong, brave, and proud. And when I put my mind to it, 
I know that I can do it. That's a line from one of my favorite books, Girls Can Do Anything by Carol Hart. It has pictures of girls exploring, making art and music, conducting science experiments, and playing different sports. And it's absolutely true. Girls can do anything. Just because one book says girls can do anything doesn't mean it's true. I think I'm going to drop out of the class election. I'd rather not try at all. Whoa. Hold on just a second. There isn't just one book that says girls can do anything. There are hundreds of them. Books like Little Leaders, Bold Women, A is for Awesome, Her Story, 50 Women and Girls Who Shook Up the World, and Rad American Women A to Z, Rebels, Trailblazers, and Visionaries Who Shaped Our History, and Our Future. Each of these books tells true stories of girls and women who were trailblazers, showing the world that girls can accomplish anything they set their minds to. Just because we haven't had a female president yet doesn't mean amazing women haven't been doing amazing things for centuries. You shouldn't give up on your dreams to be president of the student body just because of what some silly kid said. Just because a girl hasn't won before doesn't mean that you can't be the very first one. Wait, what? Was that bug just talking? Oh, yeah. I forgot to introduce you to our two other friends. The little bug sitting on my shoulder is the reading bug. Hi. And the bee buzzing over here is the spelling bee. Nice to meet you. Oh, great. You're playing some kind of trick on me. Well, it's not very funny. Bugs can't talk. I beg your pardon. The reading bug and spelling bee are very special. The reading bug can talk, and she can also read books. Lots and lots and lots of books. And the spelling bee likes nothing more than spelling words and casting spells. The reading bug has a magic book bag that she uses to take my reader friend and me on wonderful adventures to all kinds of different places in the past, present, and future. I don't believe in magic. People can't travel through time except in science fiction books and movies. Why don't you come with us on our adventure today and see for yourself? I think it might cheer you up. And there's someone special that I'd like you to meet who might just inspire you to think again about running for class president. If you really do have a magic book bag that takes you on adventures, why are you standing around talking to me? Don't you have some place better to be? Our adventure is always to a place and a time that the reading bug has been reading about. She puts the books she has been reading in her book bag, and that's how the magic begins. Then... Powered by the book bag's magic and our imaginations, we travel through time and space on an amazing adventure. Reading Bug, can you tell us some of the books you've brought with you in your book bag today? I sure can, Lauren. Let me see. I've got Chains by Lori Hulse Anderson, Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes, Founding Mothers of the United States by Celine Castroville, Leave It to Abigail by Barb Rosenstock, and Who is Betsy Ross by James Buckley Jr. Oh, I know who Betsy Ross is. My mom and dad told me that they named me after her. So, your name is Betsy? That's right. Mom says that we are actually distant relatives of Betsy Ross. That's so cool. Betsy Ross was born in colonial America, before there was a United States of America. The British controlled the American colonies back then, and women mostly stayed at home and took care of their families. But Betsy was different. When her husband died, she didn't listen to the people who said that a woman couldn't run a business. Instead, she opened a shop in Philadelphia, where she made and repaired curtains, tablecloths, bed covers, and rugs. She became known as one of the best seamstresses in Philadelphia, and during the American Revolution, George Washington brought her a sketch of the first American flag and asked her to make a sample that he could show to the new Continental Congress. Later, the Congress passed a law that the flag of the new United States of America would look like the sample that Betsy Ross made. During the American Revolution? The American Revolution was the war the American colonists fought in with the British to win their independence from the British king. Do you know how many colonies there were in America? I know there were 13 colonies because Betsy Ross's flag had 13 stars and 13 stripes, which stood for the 13 colonies. Exactly right, Betsy. Lauren, do you know the names of the original 13 American colonies? Well... I know that one of them was Massachusetts, because we visited Massachusetts on one of our adventures when we went to the first Thanksgiving celebration there. And I'm pretty sure that New York was another colony, right? Right. Betsy, you told us that Betsy Ross lived in Philadelphia, which is a city in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania must have also been a colony. That's three. Reader, do you know any of the other ten? The other ten colonies were New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, 
New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Reading Bug, are we traveling back in time to the American Revolution on our adventure today? That was more than 200 years ago. You guessed it. We're going back to the American Revolution, which is also called the U.S. War of Independence, and I'm hopeful we can meet a very special someone on our trip. Who? I gave you a couple of clues earlier. Remember, I told you that I brought the books Founding Mothers of the United States and Leave It to Abigail with me for our adventure? Yes. Is that who you're hoping we'll meet then, Reading Bug? Abigail something? Yes, yes, yes. Abigail Adams. She was the wife of John Adams, the second president of the United States. We've all heard a lot about our founding fathers. Famous men like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and John Adams. But Abigail Adams is considered to be one of the most famous founding mothers of the United States of America. She is also often referred to as America's first feminist. As long as we're heading back in time, I thought Mrs. Adams might be exactly the person Betsy should meet. I'm not saying I believe you yet, but uh, if we were to be going back in time together today, I do think it would be fun to meet Abigail Adams and to learn from her. But heading back in time and into the middle of a dangerous war doesn't sound exactly safe. I learned in school that lots of colonists died during the American Revolution and that there were shortages of basic supplies like food, weapons, and blankets. It could be really dangerous. Don't worry, Betsy. Lauren, Reader, and I have been on a lot of adventures together, and we've faced different kinds of danger on each of them. But we always figure out a way to get home, safe and sound. The reading bug is right, Betsy. It wouldn't be an adventure without a little danger. Remember, girls can do anything. Before we go, we always stretch out to get ready for whatever awaits us on our journey together. A little stretch I'm guessing you'll feel a lot better about going with us. Everybody, stand up, unless you're buckled into your car or tucked into your bed, and wiggle your fingers and toes. Are you wiggling? Great! Now, stretch your arms up high over your head. Perfect! Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, let's get ready to go. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, now we're ready to go. That did feel great. One last thing before we go. Reader. Did you remember to bring crayons and paper with you today so you can draw illustrations of all the things that we see and do on our trip back in time to the American Revolution? Illustrators draw the pictures in the books we read, and just like them, you can draw pictures of everything we experience today. You can draw anything you want, and your illustrations will help you retell our story to your friends and family when we head back home. At the end of today's adventure, we'll take some time to listen to music and draw our illustrations, but you're welcome to stop and draw at any time. Just pause the podcast and press play again when you're ready to continue. I can't wait to see all the pictures you'll draw. If you didn't remember to bring crayons and paper, don't worry. Just press pause or have a grown-up do it for you and get them now. The reading bug, the spelling bee, Betsy and I will wait right here for you. B, I know that you love casting spells just as much as you love spelling. So do you want to cast a spell to take us on our adventure today? I do. I do. How about this? Magic book bag take us back to the American Revolution when the colonists were fighting to create a new nation. They battled the British because they wanted to be free to form a new type of government, a democracy. Don't forget about Abigail Adams. I mean, if this thing really works. We hope that on our adventure today we encounter Abigail Adams, one of this country's founders. Great rhyming, B. Wow, what's happening? That little bag is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Big enough to fit us all inside. And I can't believe my eyes, but I think I see things floating around inside. Those are from the books that the reading bug brought with her. Images come to life with the magic we were telling you about. Reader, I can see lots of different animals. White-tailed deer, red and gray foxes, wolves and black bears. I see a giant bell, and it's a beautiful bronze color. I see men and boys wearing three-cornered hats, long coats to come down to their knees, white shirts, knee socks, 
and black shoes with big buckles on them. I see them too. The men's hair is pulled back into ponytails, and there are women and girls wearing long dresses with long scars over their shoulders, stockings and flat buckled shoes, and white mop caps on their heads, just like the cap that Laura wore in the pictures from the Little House on the Prairie books. Most of the images look peaceful, but I can see soldiers marching just over there. Some are wearing black three-cornered hats, red jackets, and white pants. Those must be the British soldiers. They were called the Redcoats because of their red jackets. I also see soldiers who appear to be wearing their ordinary everyday clothes, some whose clothes are very ragged. I bet those soldiers are the colonists. They were called the Patriots. P-A-T-R-I-O-T. A patriot is a person who loves his or her country and is ready to bravely support and defend it. The colonial soldiers were called patriots. There are lots and lots of interesting words in the book bag, too. Words like Continental Congress, Declaration of Independence, Hessian, Boston Tea Party, Muskets, and Bayonets. I also see letters, not the kind that make up words, but the kind you send in the mail. There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of them, and they're all signed either by Abigail or John Adams. There could easily be thousands of letters. I read that Abigail Adams was an amazing letter writer. She wrote over 2,000 letters, and many of them to her husband, John. Oh no, I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's just so, so awful. Spelling Bee, what is it? What did you see? Reading Bug, was there anything horrible or scary in the books you brought? I don't think so. The letters, they're horrifying. It's, it's spelling slaughter. Spelling slaughter? The letters, all the letters are jam-packed with misspelling. So many that it will take me hours and hours to correct them all. Didn't John and Abigail Adams ever learn how to spell? I'm looking at orthographic annihilation. O-R-T-H-O-G-R-A-P-H-I-C. Orthography is a set of rules for writing, including rules for how to spell words correctly. (laughs) Calm down, B. It's not that bad. Abigail's letters did include many misspelled words. But back then, everyone spelled the same words in different ways because there weren't rules for how to spell words until Noah Webster published his first dictionary in 1806. Oh! B. Just think of our adventure today as a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for you to mitigate misspelling mayhem by setting the record straight on how to spell some of the words that we come across. Are we going to wait here all day agonizing over spelling errors, or are we going to get on with this adventure? That's what I thought. Okay, Betsy, are you ready for this? How about you, B? Reader? Great. Then on the count of three, let's jump into the book bag together. One... Two, three, jump! Let's jump inside our book bag. What will we find there? Imaginations run away. What's in our book bag? Our trusty book bag. What will we learn about today? This is incredible. It sure is. The book bag is taking us up, up, up into the sky, and we're floating over the clouds, looking down on vast areas of land. Betsy, look at this. My watch is counting backwards. That means we're going back in time. More than 200 years back to the American Revolution. Look, as we float through the sky, we are approaching the edge of the North American continent. I see towns on the coast that are surrounded by small, tidy houses. Some are made of brick or stone, and others are made of wood. The houses are dotted about a landscape filled with green pastures where horses and cows are grazing, pens where pigs are rooting, wooden barns where chickens are pecking for food outside, and tidy green plots of land where corn, wheat, vegetables, and other crops are growing. Between some of the houses, there are dark green forests. I bet that's where all the wild animals swirling around in the book bag live. I also see a few villages surrounded by log walls with small round houses built around a central square. I read that the Wampanoag Indians lived in small round houses called Weetoots, or wigwams. The villages with round houses are probably Wampanoag villages. But we're heading in a different direction, towards a small village located close to a river just south of the town. It's filled with houses, not wigwams. Hold on tight, this book bag is coming in for a landing. 
coming in for a... I sure hope we don't land in the middle of a battlefield. A what? Oof. Is this really happening? Lauren, pinch me. I think I must be dreaming. Ouch. Hey, wh wh what was that? It sounds like we may have landed in the middle of a battlefield after all. What are we going to do? Those sounds are pretty far away. At least I think they are. And maybe we are only hearing the sounds of fireworks. I read that the first organized Independence Day took place on July 4th, 1777, exactly one year after the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. Just like our 4th of July celebrations today, there were picnics and dinners, military demonstrations, and fireworks. C-O-N-T-I-N-E-N-T-A-L. The Continental Congress was a group of men who were authorized by 13 colonies to represent them and who acted on their behalf. Yep. But it could be a battle. It could. There's really only one way for us to find out. We're going to have to get out of the book bag. Spelling Bee and I will go first. Follow us. I think we're safe. At least for now. Look, we've landed on the top of the hill. There aren't any soldiers up here. Just a woman and a boy gazing out across a valley into the distance. I guess we should introduce ourselves, right? Uh, hello, ma'am. Oh my goodness, you startled me. Who on earth are you? Girls dressed in pants? And boys without hats and waistcoats? Dressed like that, you're certainly not from around here. But you don't look like redcoats or hessians either. Hessians were German soldiers that the British hired to fight for them in the American Revolution. Oh, no. We're not British or Hessians. We're Americans. America? My name is Lauren. This is Betsy. And this is our reader friend. We're here on an adventure from the future. We are dressed like this because in the future, girls and boys all dress pretty much the same way. Unless we're dressing up, most of us wear pants or blue jeans and t-shirts. We traveled here today with the reading bug and the spelling bee in a magic book bag. Time travel? Magic? I don't mean to frighten you, but you should not be talking about those things here. Most of the colonists here in Massachusetts Colony are Puritans, and we believe that all magic is evil, and that people who practice magic are witches. Most people here want to drive these witches out of our communities or worse. Johnny, stand behind me, dear. I'll protect you. Yes, Mother. Oh no, we aren't witches or wizards, but we do know some, and our magic book bag is good, not evil. Mama, they have pet bugs, you see? I'm not the only one that likes to collect insects. The reading bug and spelling bee aren't exactly pets. They're our friends. Spelling bee? I could certainly use one of those. My spelling is terrible and my handwriting is not much better. You know, this is all very strange. But today has already been a very strange and frightening day, so I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Where are my manners? My name is Abigail Adams, but you should call me Abigail. This is my oldest son, John Quincy. Abigail Adams? Pleased to meet you, ma'am. I'm only seven years old, but I'm the man of the house now because my father is far away in Philadelphia. Yes, dear girl, I am Abigail Adams. I would ordinarily offer a group of travelers such as yourself a cup of tea, but we're not drinking tea these days, not since the Boston Tea Party. But I would ordinarily offer a group of travelers such as yourselves a cup of coffee. Way back in 1773, the British placed a tax on tea. Way back? The tea tax made the colonists very angry because they loved to drink tea. They were so mad they decided to fight back. When three British ships sailed into the Boston Harbor, some of the colonists painted their faces to look like Native Americans, leapt on board the ships, and dumped tons of valuable tea into the harbor. Their actions made King George III Back in Great Britain, furious. He shut down the Boston Harbor and passed even worse laws to punish the people of Boston. That's exactly right, little bug. Now, I would ordinarily offer you coffee and jumble cookies, but there is no time today for coffee and cookies. I'm afraid you've arrived at a terrible time. Oh no, what's happening? Is it more bad spelling? I heard some loud noises this morning that sounded like gunfire, so John Quincy and I climbed up this hill with my spyglass to see if we could find the source of the noises. S-P-Y-G-L-A-S-S. -S. A spyglass is a small collapsible handheld instrument that makes distant objects appear nearer. It's similar to a set of binoculars, but only for one eye. 
John Quincy and I have been watching what appears to be a terrible battle between the Redcoats and the Patriots that is taking place right in Boston. We're too far away to tell who is winning, but from the number of shots and volume of the smoke, I think we're witnessing a major battle. I'm worried that if the Redcoats win, they will march to our homes, since we are only 10 miles from Boston. A major battle in Boston? Abigail, can you tell us what day it is? Yes, of course. It's June 17th, 1775. Abigail, you and John Quincy are watching the Battle of Bunker Hill. It's the first major battle of the American Revolution. But how could you know? I read in Magic Treehouse American Revolution that the Battle of Bunker Hill took place on June 17th, 1775, when the British saw that the Patriots had built a fort on Breed's Hill. They marched up the hill to destroy the fort. The Patriots had meant to build the fort on Bunker Hill, but their commander ordered them to build it on Breed's Hill, which was nearby. Someone is approaching. Quickly, John Quincy, hide behind me. The rest of you, please, don't talk about magic or all our lives will be in danger. Mistress Adams, I've been looking everywhere for you. I am Paul Revere, and I've been sent to bring you news of the Battle of Bunker Hill that is taking place in Boston. Paul Revere? I went to your house, but I only found your servants and your little ones there. All that your daughter Nabby could tell me was that you and your son had left to find a hill where you could view the fighting. Thank you so much for bringing us news of the battle, Master Revere. I hope that it is good news. John Quincy and I have been watching up here since early this morning, and our friends have just joined us. But we have not been able to determine who is winning and who is losing. Reading Bug, that man said he was Paul Revere. We have all read about him. He's the American hero who rode through the villages and farms to warn other colonists that British soldiers had crossed the Charles River and were headed to Concord, yelling, The British are coming! The British are coming! as he rode. Yes! I read in Who Was Paul Revere that Paul Revere loved to ride horses and that he often rode to deliver messages from the Sons of Liberty. Unfortunately, the news is not good. I've been sent by the Sons of Liberty to tell you and the other women and children in this area that although the Patriots have beaten back the Redcoats twice today and kept them from taking the hill, they have now run out of ammunition. The Redcoats are preparing to launch their third attack, and if the Patriots lose this battle, the Redcoats will likely march this way, and your life and those of your children and neighbors will be in grave danger. Master Revere, my husband John advised me in one of his recent letters that in case of real danger, I must flee to the woods with our children. But I cannot leave the farm, our workers, our crops, and our livestock. Instead, I will stay here and fight. You cannot stay. There are no men here to defend you. You are only a woman. No, your only choice is to flee as your husband has advised you to. Wait just one second there, Mr. Revere. Abigail may be a woman, but she is not only a woman. That's right, dear. Master Revere, you say that I cannot do the work of a man. Well, during John's absence, I have dug potatoes and hired farmhands to work our crops. I have preserved food while teaching all four of my children to read and write. I have bargained for food and bartered for supplies. I have invested our money, and I have fed the militia and housed refugees fleeing Boston. In short, I have successfully undertaken all of the tasks that were formerly my husband's. If I can perform a man's work, then rest assured that I am also capable of making my own decisions. You tell him! Let me tell you what we will do. If the Patriots need more ammunition, we will make it, and you will carry it back to them. Last month, at my brother's suggestion, I melted my pewter spoons in a kettle over the fireplace and poured the liquid pewter into bullet molds that my brother had brought to me. It was like a bullet soup, right, Mother? Yes, it was, dear. And although I have no more pewter, I do still have those molds. But your neighbors will have more pewter. Mistress Adams, your plan is an excellent one. I will ride through town to gather pewter from your neighbors, and together we can quickly make new ammunition for our patriots to use in their battle against the Redcoats. I will return with the pewter just as quickly as my horse's legs can carry us. Godspeed and good luck. And that is why Abigail Adams is known as America's first feminist. She was a firm believer women could and should be able to do anything that men could do. And she wasn't shy about saying so. Feminist? 
Sadly, I had never attended school, and I don't know what that word means. Don't worry, Abigail. I do. F-E-M-I-N-I-S-T. A feminist is a person who believes that women are entitled to the same social, educational, and political rights and opportunities as men. Well, if that's the definition of a feminist, then I certainly am one. Though I may be the only feminist in the colonies, because women certainly don't have the same rights as men here. Nor do they have equal rights in Great Britain. Women are denied the right to an equal education, and we also lose control over our property, if we ever had any, when we were married. Additionally, only men are allowed to make contracts or sue anyone. And have you noticed that all 60 delegates to the Second Continental Convention in Philadelphia are white men? As I wrote to my husband John, who is one of the delegates to the convention, I have often thought that the passion for liberty cannot be equally strong in the breasts of those who have been accustomed to deprive their fellow creatures of theirs. I could go on. Now that we have put my plan in place, there is little for us to do except wait and pray for a victory for the Patriots. Why don't we all walk back to my home for that cup of coffee and jumbo cookies I mentioned earlier? That sounds wonderful, Abigail. Thank you. A rest is just what we need after so much excitement. I'll pause our adventure here and play a bit of music while we all rest and draw pictures of everything we've seen and done so far. You can draw a picture of our new friend Betsy, or of Abigail and her son, John Quincy Adams, or perhaps you'd like to draw a picture of Paul Revere riding on top of his horse. You could also draw a picture of the first American flag that Betsy Ross made. It has 13 red and white stripes, just like our modern flag. But the blue square in the top left corner has just 13 white stars laid out in a circle to represent the 13 colonies. When we resume our adventure, we'll need to be prepared for whatever happens next. If the Redcoats win the Battle of Bunker Hill and march to Abigail's farm, who knows what dangers we might encounter. But I know, whatever happens, everything will turn out just fine because... When you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything as you grow. You'll show this world that you can be anything. You could write a book or fly a plane, build a house with a giant crane. Whatever you do, one thing will be true. There's nothing you can't do. You can see it through just by being you. Thank you for joining us on our adventure today. I can't wait to see you next time. In the meantime, if you want to read more about Abigail Adams or the American Revolution, you can find a list of all the books in the Reading Bugs book bag at thereadingbug.com slash adventures. It's a Reading Bug adventure. There's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper and your imaginations too. The Reading Bug and I can't wait to share our trip with you. Today's episode of Reading Bug Adventures is sponsored by Penguin Young Readers Group and their new picture book, There's a Ghost in This House, by New York Times bestselling author and illustrator, Oliver Jeffers. Whoa, look at that. Have you ever seen anything so cool? What are you looking at, Reading Bug? It's the pages in this book, Lauren. Look. There are translucent pages that reveal ghosts in between each page turn. This little girl is determined to find the ghost in her house, but she has never really seen one before, so she isn't sure what to look for. Oh, is it scary? Oh no, Lauren, it's magical. Check it out. I absolutely love a good interactive book. Me too, and this is a book that I'm happy to recommend to all of our listeners. You can join in the magic by purchasing There's a Ghost in This House by Oliver Jeffers at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Thanks to Penguin Young Readers for their support. Thank you for listening to Reading Bug Adventures. I'm Lauren Savage, and today's adventure was an original story written by Diane and Brandon Savage. This episode was performed by me, Chloe, Riley, and Brandon Savage, and by Gabriella Melendez and Lila Engelman. Sound mixing and mastery is by Resonate Recordings. The Reading Bug is our family-owned independent children's bookstore in California, and we are passionate about educating, entertaining, and engaging children of all ages. Learn more about us at thereadingbug.com and our personalized subscription box service at readingbugbox.com.
Thank you.